Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Great to see you. Uh, my name is State Representative Lonnie Reed uh, from Connecticut. I chair the Energy and Technology Committee in our legislature. And uh, like every other state uh, in recent years, we've been, really been grappling with a potential shutdown of our nuclear power plants. Uh, they generate uh, 2,100 megawatts. Um, 50% of our electricity, and actually since we feed into the ISO New England grid, they're the biggest generator in all of New England, and um, as you undoubtedly know, we've been shutting down, I think there are 10 nuclear plants that have been shut down um, in, since 2015, maybe. Um, and talk, Dr. Sokolov thought was so, he teed us up beautifully because the, you know, the aging infrastructure and the fact that we're really gonna have to deal with that. So we have an, an incredible panel this morning, and their resumes are in your, um, your the um, documents that you've been given, so I won't go in, oh, but they'll tell you who they are as uh, I introduce them as they begin to speak. Um, Peter Senna is the President and Chief Nuclear Officer for PSEG Nuclear. Um, I think uh, New Jersey is 50% dependent on nukes. Um, Jake Smeltz is the Chief of Staff to State Senator Ryan Almond uh, of Pennsylvania. Susan Tierney is the senior advisor to the analysis group. And actually Susan was, she testified in front of our legislature and did an amazing job of really explaining it as, as everyone knows. Uh, people always enter a room, they either love nukes or they hate nukes. And they, they sort of really don't understand where they fit in our energy ecosystem at the moment and, and where we really are, you know, how, how how, um, you know, how soon are we going to really deploy renewables to, and tee them up and have storage and all the things that are going to make them viable? And Susan did an excellent job. And Stephen Bennett um, is our last panelist, um, and he is the manager of regulatory, uh, regulatory and legislative affairs for PJM, uh, which is a regional transmission organization. So we're just going to begin with some simple questions. And, and you know, the, among them, and this is where we all begin in, in our various legislatures, for, so how many more years do you think um, the region's nuclear fleet can feasibly remain in operation? So, let's see, can everybody hear me? So good morning. I want to thank, every, uh, thank Representative Reed and the Council of State governments in Princeton University, I'm honored to be here. My name is Stephen Bennett, I work for PJM. We are the regional grid operator and market operator for the, some or all of 13 states in the District of Columbia. So as a RTO, as when we look out, we don't necessarily have any kind of crystal ball or special lens where we can predict what technologies will remain in the marketplace going forward. But because our number one obligation is reliability, it's an area of very keen interest and focus for us. So the way PJM and the other RTOs, for the most part in the US, uh, achieve reliability is through a market overlay. So from a generation perspective, we look at the market, we try to leverage market forces to send economic price signals for investment, market entry, market exit. So should a generator come into the marketplace, should it stay in the marketplace, or should it exit the marketplace? And those economic signals, you know, the question that then, you, then, that then that raises, and I think it's an important one, is can a nuclear unit be uneconomic based on those price signals? And we'll get back to that, but if you look at data provided by our independent market monitor, so we have a PhD economist that has a separate company that monitors the PJM market, and in his most recent state of the market report, he put out data that says that there are some nuclear units in PJM that are getting a price signal that says that they should retire. Now, right now in PJM, there's 19 nuclear stations. So that's not a number of reactors because many of them are dual reactor or multiple reactor stations, but there's 19 stations. One of them, Oyster Creek, is set to retire this year. And a lot of that retirement was around discussions around cooling, and there was a, a settlement or an agreement that was made with the New Jersey government between the owner of the unit and the New, New Jersey government to retire that unit. Of the remaining units, three of those, based on, again, based on the IMM's data, in the most uh, conservative sensitivity of his assessment, three of those are receiving 
price signals to retire from the marketplace. So the question is, does that, what does that mean for the remaining 15? When we see <clears throat> retirements of nuclear, coal, things like that, what we do is we see a reduction in supply, probably static demand, so we do see a price differential and price conditioning that makes the environment for the remaining units, nuclear, gas, coal, whatever, more conducive to profitability. In addition to that, PJM is constantly looking at our market, our market structure, and whether or not it is uh, as efficient as it can be, as accurate as it can be, as effective as it can be, to make sure that any generation unit in our marketplace is receiving all the revenue it should for all of the services it provides. So we're looking at things like, should we change the way we do our energy pricing to make sure that units that are there, when we need them for reliability, are receiving the right price signals from the energy marketplace. We're, we've just started a look at, well, I take that back. We've been thinking about fuel security and resilience for a little over a year now, but we've just announced our intention to work with our stakeholders to determine whether or not we can actually create a market for fuel security. Can we find out deliberatively what the attributes of generation are necessary for a fuel secure portfolio can we then assign a value to them, and then can the market be used to leverage that to make sure that we're procuring the most fuel secure resources at the best possible price? So when we look out over the next several years, from the price signals that we're seeing, we don't see nuclear going away en masse. But again, it goes back to that question is, can a nuclear unit be uneconomic, and can that be an acceptable outcome from a marketplace because of the other aspects, the social good, whether it's emissions or jobs or local taxes or things like that, can that be an acceptable outcome of the price signals that the market sets? The other thing I'll say is one of the discussions around PJM and the marketplace and the nuclear units is that PJM doesn't value nuclear for all that it provides especially around the emissions question. Now, <clears throat> it's not completely accurate because if you're a Reggie state, you can include your Reggie costs in the marketplace and that's reflected in your bid and that's reflected in prices. But the question then becomes, are we, um, is it sufficient? And it can be, but the thing is, is PJM can't come up with that value. We can't come up with a carbon value, but we can reflect it in the marketplace if there is a carbon value. Um, let me ask Jake. <coughs> I know sorry. that. Uh, so, if, so if I oh, may. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, so Who go wants ahead. to speak? No, you if you don't mind, I know m many of you are from the Northeast more broadly than PJM. And so if we think about New England, New York, and the PJM states, the market operates very much the way that. Uh, Steven, Steven or Steve? Uh, Steven. Okay, Steven's just described in terms of uh, the, the signals that are going to nuclear plants. So the answer to the question of how long we're gonna have these nuclear plants around in the Northeast is it depends. First of all, they have to be completely safe. We know that is the first tier. And then I'd say there are three things. One of them is the market issue that Stephen described, and again, that's the same kind of market structure that get, exists in New England, New York, and the PJM states. And it is it, it, that market is a reflection of the cost of fuel, the cost of technologies, wind, solar, coal, et cetera, uh, and it's driven a lot by consumer interest in some of those technologies and, and not others. But it also is a function of the uh, availability or lack of public policies that set the framework for prices. So he described that if you're in a Reggie state, you are seeing a price of carbon that is about $4. And remember, we heard compared to, ten to $100 a ton from uh, Professor Sokolov. But the, um, Sokolo, excuse me. Uh, but in many of the PJM states, including New Jersey right now, the price of carbon, there is a carbon policy and it's priced at zero. And so there is a, um, 
a market problem associated with compensating somebody who provides zero emissions electricity. And that has true value to society, and it is not reflected in prices. And th so that means if that continues at zero to four dollars, that means nuclear plants are going to retire earlier than otherwise because the markets are not compensating them for something that is socially valuable and valuable to us. Think about the hurricane impacts, extreme weather impacts, all sorts of impacts associated with the costs of a carbon economy. Now, finally, it depends because uh, it depends about how long these are going to last because all of the nuclear plants that we're talking about in your regions are not owned by utility companies. They're in utility holding companies, but they're owned by a portion of those companies that has a business unit that does not have protection of rate-based investment or investment that uh, has a, uh, a price in electricity rates. So those companies have to decide a response to shareholder and stock price signals that say, can we make another three-year investment in fueling our resource for another three years? Can we expect to see returns that are consistent with a, a type of plant that is at risk in a marketplace? And so that combination, zero electricity price, excuse me, carbon price to $4, and a market structure that does not go beyond a, a, a long-term element in the price, and the, the stock market pressures are combining to put a lot of pressure on these existing nuclear plants. And just in case it's not obvious about my biases, <laughs> I believe in markets. I think that the carbon problem is hugely important and urgent. I am a former state government official in Massachusetts. I worked in state government for 15 years as the cabinet officer for environmental affairs and as a public utility commissioner. And so I believe that because we're not likely to see something come out of Washington in the near term with regard to all the things that I just described, state governments are acting and I am very glad that they are because this, the, the bridge, that important bridge that existing nuclear plants is affording for e avoiding carbon emissions is, to me, a critically important thing. And I say that when I was the age of the young people in this room, I was quite opposed to nuclear plants. But that has changed because of the carbon imperative. Yeah, so, so if I may, yeah, I, I've been in nuclear power my entire career, and I'm a chemical engineer by trade. And we have to recognize, first and foremost, that there are finite ways in which we can produce electricity. There's only a handful, a half dozen. What society needs to value is what are the attributes, the pluses and minuses, that we want to promote or understand the risk of, of continuing the generation of electricity. So my brother is a uh, police officer with New York City, and his job during Superstorm Sandy was riot patrol at the single operating gas station on Staten Island. I have another brother who's a surgeon. I, I, I told my other brother, I said, David, I am, I am not a heart surgeon, but without electricity, without my product, your job is not possible. So it's a product we all need for society. Now, it's about the attributes that we value. Now, for myself, you know, I'm very proud that nuclear power is a zero carbon emission form of electricity. Zero, right? And when people ask me, what do I do? I say, I tell them I'm an environmentalist. So, you know, Professor, your <laughs> presentation was absolutely fantastic. And I think we've all seen the, uh, uh, the CO2 emission chart on what's happening there. But your first graphic on the state of Massachusetts and where it's going was chilling. So what's, what attribute are we valuing? Now, with respect to the future of the industry, from an engineering perspective, pumps, valves, and equipment. So today, I'm starting up my Hope Creek nuclear facility after an 18-month outage. We just invested $40 million worth of capital improvements on an annual basis, $100 million to continually upgrade the facility. So from an engineering technological perspective, the plants can last their current license, 60 years. Some plants are applying for another 20 years. But in the year 2036, uh, uh, 2038, 2046, 
the license of the Salem Hope Creek units will expire. So it's not a matter of engineering, it's really gonna be a matter of economics. And today, there are the announced closure of seven nuclear power plants in the PJM region in, well, in Pennsylvania, Jersey, and New York and Massachusetts. So as those plants close, whether it's prematurely or it's through the end of their lifetime, the question is, how is that power gonna be replaced and what attribute do we value the most? Jake, did you wanna talk about Pennsylvania and your, your struggles? <laughs> um, first of all, thank you. I can't believe anybody listens to me, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I come from the great commonwealth of Pennsylvania, number four in coal production, number two in natural gas, number two in nuclear power production, number two overall power generator in the United States, and number one net exporter. So we do care a little bit about this issue, right? <laughs> um, folks, this, this, is a, this is a fascinating problem for government. I've been doing this probably longer than I should. Uh, it's complicated. It is expensive. It is multi-jurisdictional, and it is urgent. You put those things together and you ask government people to get involved and you've got yourself a real good old-fashioned food fight. Um, the reality is that this is about money. This is not about the environment. This is not about the economy, and it is certainly not about consumers. Um, the markets that Steve described uh, are on their face uh, a nice idea, right? And we all start out, those are, those are ideals. And I wanna be clear on how we buy power. Uh, we buy power through the PJM wholesale market based on short-term marginal cost. I'm gonna translate that for you know, all the other people in this room. That means that we're buying the cheapest thing today, okay? That's what we do. We don't care where it comes from, we don't care what it looks like, Steve's talked a little bit about the, the market sort of taking a good look at that, but the reality today is that we are purchasing the things that are cheapest in the sort of politically correct term, we, we say they're the most economic. Um, what does that mean? Well, due to some advances in my own state, that means that we're building lots and lots of natural gas plants. Now, I actually like natural gas. I think uh, you know the attributes provide. They're the dancing partners with renewables, right? They make those work well. Um, but they do come with sort of their own challenges, just like every technology does. The question that we have to fundamentally answer as a society with regard to the future of the plants, which I think was the question, is do we believe that the value of nuclear power production uh, to consumers, to the economy, to the environment, and quite frankly, to the security of our country <laughs> matters enough to look at what's happening around us. We don't need to be theoretical. We've seen the dominoes fall state to state across particularly the Northeast. It's now come home to Pennsylvania. It's come home to Ohio. I know this state grappled with this very issue. And I am proud that states have looked hard at what's going on. We talked about, very quickly, and I gotta be careful because you know I think we could all probably talk for about an hour. <laughs> um, we talked about numbers, right? Numbers should matter. Measuring is what I heard this morning, and uh, I think that's a good thing. There was a report put out, and you can't believe everything you read in reports, but you ought to pay attention to some of it. And the report said this, there are, uh, uh, some stations that have announced closure through the First Energy Corporation in Ohio and one in Pennsylvania, dual reactor, and of course, Three Mile Island, uh, that legacy plant near Harrisburg that I live right next to. Um, it announced you know, that it was going to decommission. And what, if you add all that together, let's talk about what that looks like. 21 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions per year. Um, 30,000 tons of criteria pollutants. Somebody asked about PM 2.5. Add that together with SO2, NOx, PM 10. That would, sit, think about that. These are four retiring stations. Um, that would set us back about 25 years in the renewable bill. The reality is we have the best, highest performing machines in the system 
highest performing, right? Those, that nasty cold spell, oh, they call it a bomb cyclone. I like the names they give them. Bomb cyclone comes along. And guess who didn't show up to work? We call this forced outages, right? The, peop the, the machines that just struggled. Natural gas was at the top, 54% of them. Some of them because their fuel wasn't available, some of them because they just didn't like to work in the winter time. I don't know. 54% of the forest outages came from that fuel source. Less than 1% came from the nuclear sources. The reality is each machine gives us a benefit, but each machine is not compensated for the benefits it gives. That's the problem, isn't it? If we paid things for what they do and what they provide, we would have the things we want. But we don't do that. We pay the cheapest thing today. Now, that works well if the cheapest thing today is the best thing today. But the problem, and I think that the, the, even the place where we're having this discussion, environment and energy, those two concepts have always worked together. And we don't do that right now. And so we're getting the results of a market that wasn't built, in all fairness to it, to do the things that I think society really wants done. So states have picked up the mantle and begun to look at this uh, on behalf of their residents. Pennsylvania, I, I would suspect, is not gonna be in any different than that. Um, there's no blame here, folks, right? The market didn't fail. The market did exactly what I think it was built to do. The question we are gonna answer is, is that what we want? And the folks in my state are taking a good look at that. They are very concerned. Uh, air quality matters. Um, look, in my world, we have waste coal generators. They help us deal with our number one chronic water problem from a legacy coal state like Pennsylvania. They burn waste coal piles. That helps us address water quality. That's a good thing. Trash to steam plants help us deal with solid waste issues. That's a good thing. What's not a good thing is looking at short-term economics making long-term choices. If everyone believed that that was a good decision, we'd all shop at Walmart for all our clothes. The reality is we make choices based on what we want and what we need. And our markets today, as good as they are, and I, 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 if anybody in this room other than this guy right here can tell me how, <laughs> in some level of detail, the wholesale electric market works, raise your hand high. Right? I mean, it is, I can't tell you, people just scratch their heads. It is, we used to make choices as humans, right? Vertically integrated monopolies, regulators, they sat down and they said, what do we need to build? When do we need to build it? How does it need to look? What are our needs? And now we make choices based on a computer that takes in bids and spits out a result. And everyone says, okay, well, I guess that's what we're going to do for the next 10 years. I think that we need to be smarter than that. The folks in Pennsylvania know we need to be smarter than that, and I think we can be. Uh, I hope that that invites us to the next question because we spent well, a lot. Of, well, the short short answer. Yeah. The short answer for me is, and with all due respect to Steve and his folks, every single station is in line to close. It's a matter of when. If you are not cheaper than the next guy or gal. You, my friend, will eventually exit this market because that's exactly what those price signals are telling you to do. So it's a question of when, not if. Yeah, and, and Jake, I, I want to you know, emphasize the point you made with respect to First Energy. So before I came to uh, public service, I was the chief nuclear officer for First Energy, responsible for those four nuclear plants that have announced their closure in the next three years. And I emphasize the point you made, so it's not just 3,000 jobs and my friends that are going to be unemployed and the impact to the local community, but all the progress that we have made in carbon-free emissions will be, in the last 25 years, will be wiped out with the closure of those power plants. The problem is, with all due respect, that it's, the market is great for what it's designed to do. Correct. We would not have the high operational performance of the nuclear plants in the Northeast that we have without the pressure of the market. That it was a really good thing. But the markets don't reflect fuel security. They don't reflect carbon. And they don't reflect, and, and this is going to be a place where I break with the way that 
First Energy has been asking for help from the federal government. They've been asking for help for their coal and their nuclear fl fleet. So fuel security is provided by coal. Carbon is a problem with coal, the coal production. Absolutely. And there is a public benefit associated with the exist, having the United States continue to have a capability in nuclear operations because without that capability, we don't sit at the table internationally in a leadership position in the nuclear industry. And that would be a really bad problem for the United States. The pro now, the problem is without state action on these issues, the market therefore is not going to choose these issues. The, the way that the industry is responding is by joining the, the fortunes of coal and nuclear plants together. And that invites bad federal policy that will be very bad for markets. So if we could think about getting a carbon price or a value for public, uh, the, the public value of US leadership in the nuclear world into the markets, we'd be in great shape but we're not gonna get a price on carbon out of the federal government. And we're probably going to get something that helps coal and nuclear in the same way, and that will not help on the carbon side, and that will crash the markets. Sorry, Madam Representative, I couldn't help myself. Oh, goody, goody. <laughs> Sorry. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting, uh, building on what you just said, um, our millstone, I think the, the 900 um, megawatt generator had to shut down to repair something. And the immediate spike in bad air quality, it was unbelievable. As they turned on peakers to make it up uh, throughout New England. We hadn't had such bad air for 10 years. So that was a cause and effect that we saw instantaneously, um, you know, building on, on the points that you've made. Um, moving on to question two, and um, it... <laughs> How are we doing? <laughs> we're good. We're good. <laughs> are you ready for question two? Um, and I was, it was uh, Dr. Sokolov talked about, he called them uh, swimming pools, uh, the, the nuclear lagoons of, uh, of waste. And of course, when we're trying to um, deal as a state with figuring out how to keep our nukes running while we figure out what's next uh, in, in a real context, what's next seriously, as opposed to in our imaginations. And as a matter of fact, um, New England, as everyone knows from that region, we have terrible siting issues. It's a nightmare. So we just so, you know, I chair the Energy Committee, and out of the Environment Committee comes a moratorium on building uh, grid-scale solar on farm fields and forests, which got passed in the last day of a session last year in a, you know, a frantic horse trading. Uh, so we're working at cross purposes often. And you know, that's something we really need to factor into the timeline of how long it's going to take us to replace um, zero carbon uh, generation. Um, but the waste storage is one of the issues that when people come to testify, I mean, they go on and on and on about it. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, the lack of a long-term repository and all of that, I mean, how concerned are you? So uh, let me just try to address that. And just, it's a spent fuel pool. It's not a lagoon. So appreciate that. And I'm bathing around. <laughs> uh, it just let, let's try to understand the volume that we're talking about first off. So let's, facts always help. So the Salem units have been operating essentially 40 years. All the electricity that we've produced through nuclear fuel can be contained in a spent fuel pool, and I had to get the actual dimensions before I came here. The 40 by 37 feet. So take two backyard swimming pools. 20 by 40s, all the electricity that we've generated fits in a pool of that size. So it's a very compact energy source. So now as the fuel has decayed, as the temperature has cooled down, we are actively transporting that fuel into dry cast, as the professor said. We have a campaign due to start next month. Every year we are active in placing that fuel from the pool to the pad. The dry cast systems designed, they're actually constructed out of a corporation local out of Camden, New Jersey, uh, US jobs. Those are useful life, 100 years. Right? The question about the long-term repository, 
if you were to take all 99 nuclear power plants and all the fuel that we have across all 99, you can essentially put it in an area the size of a football field, all the spent fuel pools put together. So the volume is not significant. Now, the long-term waste storage, I've been to Yucca Mountain. You cannot imagine a more remote location in the United States, where, by the way, they had above-ground atomic bomb testing, but will not store it. It is not an engineering issue. It is not a technological issue. It is a pure political issue. So could I add something uh, next? So when you think about the waste issue, there's a spectrum. Peter has just described, I got your name right? Peter has just described what happens when you're taking out the rods from the reactor and you're holding them for cooling purposes as some of the decaying of the material takes place. They stay in that for some period of time and then they move to casks at the moment and we don't have anywhere else to put them. So that is a decentralized waste system that we have right now. Our waste system is spread out all sorts of places and it, there's a difference between the, um, the and, and there are technical reasons to be comforted by that approach, but it is still a fact that we have a waste system in place already, but it is not a long-term solution. And people have been looking at a long-term solution. I studied this for my dissertation. They've been looking at a long-term solution from putting it into outer space to putting it in the ocean, to doing all sorts of things, including Yucca Mountain, and we have not gotten there, and we must get there. Uh, but then there's another piece of the waste stream that is a very local issue, and that is once a plant is shut down, it can't really be mothballed. It goes into a, 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 a nuclear regulatory commission decommissioning mode at that point. I'm probably using Im slightly improper terms. Okay. But you have to then tell the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, you know, essentially you're not going to restart that plant ever. Mm -hmm. So you're starting, you're going to lose your license and you start on the path of having to either start to dismantle the reactor and take out the less contaminated materials from the concrete and all sorts of stuff. Uh, or you're, you're going to do that through a safe store mesh, mes yeah. method, which keeps your plant pretty much as is not operating for 60 years before you start to dismantle it. And part of the timing is associated with how much money is in the trust fund to cover the dismantlement and decommissioning of the plant. The longer you wait, the more interest you've got. So there's, there's a real trade-off of having enough money and just keeping it as a not operating reactor. So that's, again, a quite decentralized mode of waste storage. And there's, there's one consideration of figuring out how to put that site back into a useful purpose again, or at least the portions of it that you can. And uh, so there's a very complicated set of questions in the waste stream, and uh, they're of interest to the states from my point of view. Others? Um, last <laughs> September. I was over in France, uh, not sightseeing, by the way, and I actually got to tour. They actually recycle their fuel, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I got to tour that facility. Boy, you want to talk about smart folks. Uh, this is not something that America has pursued. Thank you, Jimmy Carter. Um, this is something that we have essentially pushed off. And as was very eloquently described, it remains an issue. Um, I challenge anyone to name a fuel source that doesn't have a challenge, right? Come to Pennsylvania and you're going to learn a lot about <laughs> hydraulic fracturing. Uh, and we're going to talk about water quality. Uh, come to Pennsylvania and we'll talk about legacy coal issues. Uh, these are the challenges of humankind. Uh, harnessing the value, the in intellect, the science, um, and all these things combined, the, the to, to create a 21st century lifestyle that most people still like to enjoy, other than my Amish friends, because I'm from Lancaster County in Pennsylvania, <laughs> right? That's why I got the name Jake. But the reality is we can have both. 
we need to do that in a very considered way. I was like the voice of God. I thought, this is kind of <laughs> oh my God, I've just been promoted. Um, we can have both. And we just, we need to get through the politics to get to the science and get to the management. Um, that's what makes this country so incredibly blessed, right? So we don't have to put all our eggs in a gas basket or a nuclear basket mm -hmm. or a coal basket or a renewable basket. We can have a blended program that takes the best of all that we have and uses it to the betterment of all of our people. So just, sorry, I stole, I, I stole your microphone before. Does this, is this one working? I'm gonna have to steal that one. Sorry. So these transmission people are very aggressive. Yes. <laughs> We believe in sharing. Um, the, um, so PGM doesn't really have a strong opinion on waste storage. It's not within our purview, so I won't take up much time. What I'll say is, and this is more Stephen Bennett, who's worked for two companies that own and operate um, nuclear plants, and Dr. Sokolo kind of mentioned it, the, the fear of nuclear is, is, is an issue that has to be dealt with. And if you visit a nuclear plant, so if you haven't, if you're a policymaker of any kind, and you haven't visited a nuclear plant, please do. Because the security, the safety, the cleanliness, the dedication of the people at these plants is outstanding. These companies have, and Susan said it, some of it was because of the discipline of the markets, but they have raised the performance level of these units exponentially. And they've taken the best and brightest people, including those from the nuclear Navy, brought them in and turned these into just monuments of efficiency and security. Um, so again, this is a Stephen Bennett thing, but if you haven't seen a nuclear plant and you have an opportunity, you should, you should see one. Thank you. Um, we have actually, I should say in Connecticut, um, they dismantled Connecticut Yankee several years ago. And um, it's on a beautiful hillside overlooking the Connecticut River in Haddam, Connecticut. And there's still a sarcophagus that remains on site with armed guards. So it's sort of hard to figure out how to you know, repurpose what's left behind and how close people can get to it. And uh, so it is uh, an ongoing expenditure in perpetuity. Um, the next question is, uh, what is your number one priority regarding the production of nuclear power in the United States? So, all right, let me, let me take that, and it's, it's quite simple. So I'm, I'm a former naval officer, uh, ran uh, nuclear submarines for the U.S. Navy, and bottom line, it is safety. Safety one, safety two, safety three, because if we are not safe, we won't be here. And what, what I like to tell folks, it's my plant, my people, and our local community. We live there. And so why would we do anything that would absolutely put those units at jeopardy? Uh, and the way we operate, our, our mode of operation and, and, our, and our creed, we have, we have a nuclear safety culture, but as we come into decision making and have to make choices, how we run the plant, what we invest in, what we tell our folks is always stay on the right side of goodness. Because our job is, to, we, are, we are blessed by the local community to run the nuclear power plant. And it requires us to, to gain their trust, be transparent with them. So I grew up in Long Island. All right, Stony Brook, all right, real close to the Shoreham Nuclear Power Plant that never ran. That facility, or rather Long Island Lighting Company, they lost the trust of the local population. So without the trust, you won't be there. And to establish trust, you need to be transparent and you need to be safe at all times. That's the way we do business, period. Representative or, or Madam Chairman, since I agree with what he said, can I put it as my number one? Can I do it, a 1A? <laughs> Certainly. So what he said, and <laughs> keeping a discussion, just as you were doing today, about the implications of either caring for a continued fleet of operating nuclear plants, or not, because I agree with was it you who said that it, if things don't change, it's a matter of when, not if we're going to lose the existing merchant, uh, non-utility nuclear plants. So um, keeping this discussion is my next priority because I think that's the way that we will address the market 
failures, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way, I mean that with my economics hat on, we don't have prices in markets that are fully reflecting the value of products that are being produced for us. So I'm calling that a market failure without blame, but it is a problem that keeping a discussion going could help fix. So I think that's really important. And again, I want to come back to this question of keeping you, the U.S. with an to important toe in the water of knowing about nuclear operations is really important for having the U.S go into discussions with Russia and China and other organizations internationally that are involved in the nuclear enterprise, I think that's really very important. Um, it has to be said. <laughs> Safety. Uh, if you don't believe me, I've been through many, many, many stations. They even make you hold the handrails going down the steps. <laughs> it matters. Uh, I live and have grown up outside of Peach Bottom Atomic Station in Lancaster. That's actually York County next door, but it's right along the river. Right up the river, it's Three Mile Island, and uh, we all remember in 1979. If you don't, you can Google it. Um, <laughs> it was sort of a moment, and if you come to visit, they have a big sign that commemorates that accident. Um, the reality is uh, we have to always put the safety of our people first. And that's one of the components of the discussion about the plants, not about the safe operation of the plants, but about the security of the country. Um, there is one pipeline, one natural gas pipeline, which feeds, is, provides feedstock for about 14 gigawatts of power production. One pipeline. And that's 14,000 megawatts, right? Now, let's think about that. That's enough to power roughly the city of Washington, D.C. Um, the funny part about the pipelines, and I'm not inviting people to do bad things here, I want to be clear on that, but we all know where they're at, right? They go through this very elaborate public siting process. Uh, there are 40-foot swaths of right-of-way cut so that they can be maintained. Um, there is a real question that has sort of emerged in this debate as the, the bulk system has migrated particularly to, 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 to natural gas generation, about what that could mean in terms of the security of the country. Um, we heard a discussion about what happens if they lose power in New York City for a day or two. You know, let's look at Puerto Rico. Um, the reality is that all of this matters because we plug in our phones, we expect to be connected, and we want to make sure that we can communicate. I think everything runs by a computer today. Um, all these things are materially important, and it's not a fanciful idea to say that security doesn't matter. Go to a nuclear station. Mr. Bennett did a great job telling you how secure they are, because they have to be. Um, when we depend on a commodity like electricity, we cannot take for granted that it will be delivered, uh, that it can be produced without problems. Um, but the, at the end of the day, when you talk about you know, nuclear power, Safety, um, just like I would argue for each of the particular resources. So I won't beat the safety issue into the ground, but you know, my, my mother lives down river from Peach Bottom. I work right near Limerick, so safety, of course, is probably the paramount issue with nuclear generation. But from a, let's, for me, let's look from a PJM or a markets perspective at what, the, what our priorities for nuclear are going forward. And for me, you know, it's the, what democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others, right? So for me, market economies are the worst kind of economies except for all the others. So what, what I truly believe and what PJM I think has proven from a reliability perspective, let's see if I can get this microphone right here, is that markets are very powerful tools in the energy industry. So what I'd like for us to do is to be able to have a very reasonable, deliberative discussion over what constitutes fuel security. So not just reliability, which is important, and it is, again, our number one obligation, but in the event of a, in, in a catastrophic event, in a, what I hope is a very low probability but high impact event, 
what are the attributes of the generation fleet and PJM that we need to make sure that we can operate through and recover from that event? And we think fuel security is a very important part about that. But, and we've seen a lot of discussion of fuel security, but I think there's a lot of conventional wisdom as opposed to really deliberative and analytical views of what that fuel security is. So, for example, the idea that uh, a coal plant, because it has a coal pile, is fuel secure makes sense. As Jake indicated, no fuel is perfect, right? A coal pile can freeze, other things can happen. So the other conventional wisdom is that natural gas always has fuel supply issues. Except for in Pennsylvania, we're building natural gas units on the wellhead, sitting on top of 100 years of natural gas. So are they less fuel secure than a coal plant because of that coal pile versus gas in the ground? So I, I, I don't know, but what I hope is that we can come up with, again, a very analytical view of that, and then utilize the marketplace to put a value on those fuel security attributes and then compensate those generation resources that provide that fuel security. So that's, that's our, one of our first priorities. Second thing is, I would really love to see some consensus over the social value of carbon emissions. Because again, one of the things we hear, and some of this is just, I don't, maybe it's a sensitivity of mine because I believe in, in PJM and I believe in the markets, but what we hear is things like failure of the market. And I don't disagree because from an economic perspective, externalities are a failure of the market. But the, the term, and I understand you didn't mean it, it sounds pejorative, right? But the reality is, is that the market can be used to value carbon. It can be used to value externalities. But we, you know, this sounds like passing the buck. PJM is not in a position to create a value of carbon. So again, it's accurate to say that we don't value carbon. It's not accurate to say that we can't or that we won't or that we're resistant to doing it. If the policymakers, whether they're federal or state or whatever, can come to a consensus on carbon emissions and the value, they can leverage the marketplace to address that issue. I was at a conference last week and, and uh, there was a, somebody that said, you know, markets are great at solving things if you tell them what to solve for. And I believe that. So if carbon is what you want the market to solve for, tell us, let us do it, because we can't do it on our own. Then the last thing I would say is, you know, if the states do act, which they likely will, and we've seen it, they are, and, the, and you know, there's a bill sitting on the governor's desk here that has policy implications around green energy and, and nuclear and things like that, we would really like to be able to partner with the states to make sure that the states can maintain all their self-determination from a policy perspective and that we can come up with ways that we can limit or remove any kind of price distortive effects they might have. So again, our view is that the market is important for the price signals they send for investment, for reliability. We want to make sure that we can partner with the states to make sure that that self-determination exists without distortion to those markets. So I think those are our three priorities going forward. So again, so Stephen, the, so absent the markets, you know, states are stepping in as New Jersey just did. So, you know, where is that value of carbon going to come from? And today, the Salem and Hope Creek facilities supply 97% of the carbon-free energy to the state of New Jersey. The 3% is out-of-state wind and in-state solar. The governor has ambitious plans, and we fully support, to have the state fully carbon-free by 2050. So how are you going to get there? And you need nuclear as the bridge, and the governor is recognizing that. You know, I have to say, you're bringing back memories. I was uh, a news reporter in 1979, a brand new news reporter, and when we actually did news uh, <laughs> back in the day. And um, we chartered a plane and flew into Harrisburg to cover Three Mile Island, my camera crew and I. And about four days before, we had, there was some bizarre story. We were literally involved in a shootout. And... Um, you know, the, the police, you know, you could really get a lot closer to the story back in the day. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we flew in, and they were serving day glow Three Mile Island cocktails in the airport bar. And a lot of, you know, the network folks were there, and they're all having a good time. I luckily had taken a nuclear engineer with me from Millstone. And, um, we, and we had a driver meet us and took us out to the plant. And um, I was ch ch chatting with the mayor, whose last name was Reed, which is mine. And, uh, so we were doing, and he was running going door to door, 
getting people out of there. I mean, it was very sort of a homey environment in this, um, in this atmosphere. And my nuclear engineer came back to me and he said, Lonnie, I've been talking with some of the new guys here. There's been a partial meltdown of the core. And no one was publicly saying that. So everybody's running around, oh, no, it's fine. We've got it under control. And it was really terrifying. And I noticed, um, you know, since then, and um, obviously since 9-11, going on to a nuclear site now is like going on a military base. They have totally restructured how they protect these facilities. But, I mean, we went right up to the towers, and I did all my stand-ups, you know, and I did the whole thing. We were right <laughs> up on it. And so that was really quite something. Um, you know, the, I guess our final question is, and we're going to open it up for, um, for questions from the audience as well, but what poses the greatest challenge um, going forward? The, the hazard of climate change or a potential nuclear disaster or nuclear security threat? Well, since I'm the blabbermouth, I might start. <laughs> um, and I have to say, because I have the microphone, I don't like this question. It feels like <laughs> Sophie's choice. Who saw that movie? Yeah. Sophie was <laughs> had to choose about whether she would have to decide which of her kids would be saved from going into the gas chamber, or they both would go. And so all of those are problems uh, that are described. And so I want to twist it around a little bit. So each of those problems, the the dislocations economically, socially, environmentally, poverty, justice associated with climate change are just real. So huge, huge issues, which is why personally I think that I guess I would put first. We have experienced a handful of nuclear uh, reactor problems. Terrible problem in Japan. Terrible problem at Chernobyl. Uh, and of course, Three Mile Island. Uh, those we do not want to have, and that's the whole story behind the safety programs. Uh, we don't want the proliferation risks, and we don't want uh, <laughs> an attack on a reactor, and we don't want diversion of those materials into uh, unfriendly uses that would be terrible. And so I wish the president had not um, taken us out of the Iran deal. But let me say, this, the reason that I am going to just shift this is, remember, if we don't have nuclear, we are going to all of the other resources that uh, we've talked about here. Think about mountaintop mining implications of coal, if that remains uh, the alternative. Uh, water quality implications. Uh, internationally, the hundreds of millions of people who are breathing horribly horribly air quality, uh, and that will continue if we don't actually make nuclear available, in the other word, in addition to energy efficiency and renewable energy, for which we have to do everything we can to move those forward. But if you shut down the nuclear plants, again, you're going to have nat more natural gas and coal production and all of their implications, including more frac places and lots of communities in a lot of places fighting about all the benefits of fracked gas and the costs of uh, fracked gas. Um, but finally, if you shut down nuclear existing, safely operating nuclear plants, consumers' prices will go up. So it's a false choice to think that we're avoiding some of the costs. Consumer prices will go up because you're taking a around-the-clock operating reactor off-system, and you're going to operate something more expensive in this market design. So there are environmental justice, uh, climate issues, cost, uh, cost impact issues that are adverse if these plants were to be shut down prematurely. Yeah, if, if I may. So, and again, I'll gladly uh, you know, engage in anybody uh, after the sessions. I've been to Chernobyl. I've been to uh, uh, Fukushima. Uh, one of the uh, outcomes of Three Mile Island, uh, that event, was the formation of uh, INPO, the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations. Now, I, I also used to work for the NRC. I was an inspector, I was a regulator, and the NRC set standards of compliance. Post-TMI, INPO was formed to set standards of excellence. 
And it's an internal watch group in which we police each other because the industry recognizes that we are hostages of each other. That an event at one nuclear power plant anywhere in the U.S. Mm -hmm. can have an impact on every power plant in the U.S. So we hold each other accountable to the highest standards of excellence. And the way we like to operate today is, you know, what I tell my workforce and every chief nuclear officer in the industry tells their workforce the same thing. We expect perfection in the way we operate and maintain our power plants, but we'll settle for excellence. Um, boy, those are some good speeches. I think the biggest threat is ideology. Um, <laughs> folks, great. uninformed That's ideology. You know, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point fingers at everybody. Um, I think it, it, it goes to the markets, which claim that there's a purity that should exist and economic outcomes, no matter what they do and no matter where they take us, are okay. I think it's folks that say fossil fuels have no place in energy production and all those people are demonized because they are contributing to environmental and health issues. I think it's the folks that say nuclear power production is the only way to have clean air. <laughs> um, and I think it's the people that live in the renewable space that continue to propagate, uh, quite frankly, an uninformed theory that we can all live on intermittent sources of power. Uh, all those things are a threat to our ability to manage our resources and act responsibly and get what I referred to earlier, which is this blended result, right? Uh, I, I talk about it this way, uh, because if I didn't work for government, I would have money uh, as a <laughs> private sector employee. And so if I had that money and I wanted to invest it, Apple is a great company. Um, I think they've done very well. I kind of follow that stock, even though I don't own it. And the question that I ask folks is, would you put all your money in one stock? Go ahead. It's only your retirement. <laughs> I mean, it's what you're going to live on. Would you do it? No prudent investor would say that's a good idea. And that's what makes them prudent. The reality is ideologies are what challenge our politics. They challenge our policy. And they do not lead to good long-term outcomes. They're not wrong in and of themselves. Each view matters. But it's the it's the... Uh, the failure to consider other views within our own views and, quite frankly, to believe that those are the only paths that can get us to a particular destination. And so I think that in most of these debates, it is the sort of that all-or-nothing moment, um, zero-sum game. If you win, I lose. Uh, our politics reflect that today, which is a real shame. And, you know, that's what makes this issue so difficult. When I've been been working in in the Pennsylvania House and Senate for 22 years, plus or minus, when people come to do business with the assembly, there's no requirement they tell they tell the truth, right? <laughs> um, it's not like when you go into the court and you raise your hand and you promise that you're going to do your best to offer, you know, every fact true and correct to the judge. So. Okay, so these states have been wrestling with this issue, and, I, and, and there were interests that sued them. They went to a federal judge, and they said, you know, Your Honor, Illinois can't do this zero emission credit program because that violates the Federal Power Act, and that gives this guy right here all the power to set prices through his market. And the judge said, okay, well, let me see your arguments. I actually read the arguments. Um, which were fascinating, by the way. And guess what, folks? It's all about the money. They argued to the judge, read it for yourself. They, they made the same argument in Illinois. If you, as a state, provide revenue on any basis to an out-of-market out of revenue to, to a, uh, a power plant like a, New York, uh, like a, a nuclear facility, okay, um, you're interfering with these markets he talked about, right? And this is what they told the judge. They said, if you spend that money as a state, we're going to lose money in the wholesale market. Now, I'm going to quantify that for you because they did it themselves. They proved it. If they're telling the judge the truth. They said, 
we're going to lose $15 billion over 12 years if the New York program continues. You know what the New York program costs to keep those zero-emitting sources online? $480 million a year. So over the same period, rounding up is about $6 billion. She just said consumers benefit. You're darn right they do. But guess who else benefits if those nuclear stations close? Somebody else. And they just told you, if we get rid of these high-producing, price-taking uh, machines, we will make 15 more billion dollars over that period of time. Well, I don't know if I could spend six to save 15. I think that's a good deal. Look at the Illinois filing. They made the same exact argument. Unfortunately, like so many things in our society, it comes down to money. And I think that would be a real shame. I think it's a real shame because one thing that's been said here that cannot be lost on this audience and shouldn't be lost on anyone paying attention to this debate. When you make a decision about a nuclear station closing, that is irreversible. It is a choice you make and you will live with going forward. We're not building new ones. If you don't believe me, go to South Carolina and talk to them. They got about halfway through one and had to quit. It matters. So you really don't get a second bite at this apple. You got to get it right. And if you care about air quality, you care about consumer, long-term consumer benefit, you care about, we talked about reliability. I don't think the lights are going to go out. I think we're pretty smart that way. But if you care about what happens if we have a system issue where some of the attributes of the other machines can't provide, you know, what we need to keep the lights going, or if you care about security of this country, it's time to wake up. We are in the midst of it right now, and it has every single state that has looked at this issue has had to make a choice, and we're going to make one too. Um, I hope that instead of being driven by ideologies, we can be driven by the cooperative spirit that Steve talked about, but the problem is money's involved. If it were just about everybody looking and saying, academically, what would be sort of the best way to do this? I think we could probably get that answer with, you know, the smart people in this room. But because financing, financial, financial benefit is involved, you're going to see all sorts of arguments being made. Because at the end of the day, those folks want to win. And they don't, they're not winning on environmental. They have no obligation to that, right? That's a common purpose. Theirs is a singular purpose, and that's to their shareholders. And shareholders don't put in their report how great they are in terms of helping, you know, solve air quality issues. That's sort of a social argument that they make as a side benefit. If you're not profitable, it doesn't matter. And that's where we're at. Some of these stations aren't profitable. I will argue all of them aren't. It's just a matter of where they're at in terms of their ability to carry their existing costs today. Um, so anyway, that was a pretty long answer, but I think ideology is what's killing us, folks. I do, and it's, it's a shame. It really is, because all of the machines have value. So um, if the choice is nuclear disaster or climate change, then I pick C, none of the above. So, um, and PJM's not in a position to comment on the relative risk of those two. What I'll say, maybe just to sum up is the markets in and of themselves are not the end-all be-all, but they are a tool. And they have proven successful, not just in the energy industry, but across our entire economy. If you wanna allocate scarce resources in an efficient manner, markets can do that for you. If you wanna value an externality and have markets then allocate the scarce resource of the, of the, of the externality, they can do that for you. So the question is mostly around, so in the areas that have restructured wholesale markets, you can choose to try to leverage the tools that, that are there. You can try to do something that is in opposition to the marketplace, or you can try to do something different. I mean, those are, you know, it's A, B, or C. I think what PJM is saying is that we want to be part of the discussion so that if the markets can be part of the solution, we want to be there because we think, again, We've proven from a reliability perspective that it's worked very well for 20 years. When we look at fuel security and the initiative that we just kicked off, we hope to have those, that, 
that first main uh, thrust that would actually value fuel security in place in a year. Okay, so that's not super fast, but when you think about the fact that we're a stakeholder-driven organization with a thousand stakeholders, and we think that we can actually get a deliberative analytical process where we actually come to a decision on what, me what fuel security means and how to value it in a year, that's not bad. And that would put us in, in position to actually have fuel security be part of our next capacity auction. So the markets aren't perfect. We acknowledge that all the time, and that's why we're trying to, to make them better when we can and how we can. But, but because we're not perfect doesn't mean that we're not effective, right? And that we can't be part of this solution. Thank you. I really love this discussion of ideology. Uh, my colleague, uh, Representative Jonathan Steinberg, and I just went through. <laughs> we brought out a bill. I, th I brought it out at, what, 3.30 in the morning, two nights ago, uh, in our, the last days of our legislature. And it, was, it, it involved solar. And, um, and there's this ideological sense that the solar companies are just all wear white hats and they're just sweet, you know. And the, the jockeying for position and holding on to retail net metering subsidies uh, no matter what going forward, I mean, it was, a, it was a ferocious, ferocious battle. And, you know, high price lobbyists coming in from all over and Silicon Valley companies coming in to, you know, suck up our subsidies. They were going to import workers and then take them away after they sucked up our... So it was, it was... And to try to convince, you know, a lot of the enviros, and we, we had several enviros on our team, but, you know, there was sort of a wider community, and those are segmented as well, um, that everything they say is correct and good, it's really, really difficult. It's really, really difficult, because they do see the black hats and the white hats. And the other interesting thing is, um, talking about the siting issue um, and just how big it's getting... Um, one of the wind developers uh, shared a, um, and I think I shared this at one of our, uh, the one of our, um, our CG uh, sessions. Um, so he said, you know, the, the whole idea is that people are intellectually, they love this stuff intellectually, the renewables, until they come to a neighborhood near them. And then suddenly, wait a minute, not here, not there, wait, I like that farm field, or, you know, I like that open space, and, um, put it elsewhere. So one of the uh, wind developers told me, we've now gone from NIMBY to banana. <laughs> Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really, and the amount of um, space that things take up when you're going grid scale. I mean, these are all huge questions that we've got to grapple with. And, um, and I am, I was never very much like Sue. I was not a pro-nuclear person. It's been a lot of my life as a journalist covering Hanford, Washington, uh, you know, leaking into the Columbia River and the whole Shoreham thing. Of luckily, it never went live. Oh, they forgot to put together an evacuation plan, and um, you know, and various uh, Three Mile Island and, and things that went on before um, Dominion took over Millstone. Dominion knows how to run a nuclear plant. Northeast Utilities had had it before. Forget about it. It was sloppy. So, uh, but I really see the value of keeping it in um, our diversified portfolio and while we figure out what's next. Oh, okay, so we need questions. This gentleman here. Uh, all right, yeah, thank you very much. I was wondering if you could talk about uh, the, the idea of putting a price on carbon or a price on, or like internalizing uh, the benefits uh, of security um, has come up in the panel, and I was wondering if you could talk more about the specifics of that. So, for example, if we're looking at the PJM, do, do the three states in that need to coordinate a price on carbon for it to not distort the market, uh, sorry, distort energy production uh, between those states, or is it all right for, like, for them to kind of, to, because like from a political standpoint, it looks like it might not happen yet in Pennsylvania, but more so in New Jersey. So, um, from a pure so for our, the some or all of the thirteen states, I mean, from a pure economic perspective, a national carbon price would be the most efficient. Um, for us, the second best would be region wide. So, for our entire footprint to have it. To your point, if you have individual states or you know subgroupings of states, then you do have the potential for leakage and the distortive effect of you know what do you do in the carbon area versus a non-carbon area. 
Um, we've actually started looking at that. We put out a white paper about a year ago looking at ways we could change the market to try to minimize some of the leakage. And quite honestly, we haven't come up with the solution yet. We thought we had a good approach, and then um, a PhD economist from that other uh, Ivy League school in Cambridge uh, um, decided that there were some concerns with it, so we're taking a look at it again. So, um, you know, if, if, if again, it's th going back to one of my priorities, if, if the region or the U.S. could come to a consensus on the price and value of carbon, then the market could be leveraged to help be one of the solutions for that. May I add that, uh, remember that the REGI program covers nine states in the Northeast. It is a cap and trade program. It has worked entirely seamlessly with the competitive wholesale market. There is some leakage right now because New the border states, uh, so it's Maryland, Delaware, New York, and New England. So New Jersey's sitting in the middle. New Jersey gets some of the price impact with none of the benefits. And Pennsylvania sends resources and generation into the Reggie reading. So there is leakage. It's relatively modest. But that type of program is what I'll call very market friendly. It sends a signal. It changes the dispatch. And I think, as Vicky said, the way that it's designed is that when the states auction the allowances, the money from those auctions, rat, wait, auctions them so that a power generator ha that, that emits carbon has to buy an equivalent amount to its output of carbon. Uh, nuclear owners get a small uplift in price associated with the price impact of that. There's a little bit of compensation, but not that much, associated with Reggie for zero carbon wind, solar, biomass, and nuclear. Uh, but the way that it works, um, there were discussions originally about giving the allowances away for free to fossil generators. No state ultimately decided to do that, and I'm very glad, although I think states have the opportunity to decide that, I'm glad they didn't do that because they captured the states through their auction, get the money associated with purchases of allowances, and then the states can decide what to do with the money. And the states have overwhelmingly invested that in energy efficiency, lowering demand, and therefore lowering everybody's price of electricity because of the way that the markets work. Because the more you lower demand, the less you have to operate the most expensive plants. And states have also used it for other things, like putting credits on customers' bills by plugging holes in general fund if the state feels like that's a public use of that money. So there's a variety of ways to do it. And if you want to see the economic impact analysis of this, go to the analysis group website. We just put out a study on Reggie, and they are net positive benefits for every state that participates. And we did not comment on whether New Jersey should join or whether Virginia should join because we know states are sovereign entities in that regard. I think they both should join. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what we in Connecticut think. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm from Maine. Uh, our last and only uh, nuclear facility, the Maine Yankee, closed down about 20 years ago. Still a big looming presence yeah, right. on the river, um, and uh, disposing of the waste is still an issue. But uh, my point is uh, that I want to raise with you is that I, unless I missed it or it was too oblique for me to understand, you haven't really talked about the enormous cost of either retrofitting um, uh, facilities that are about to expire their useful life or building new ones. It's my understanding that it's become prohibitively expensive. Mm -hmm. What with um, insurance costs and um, other uh, concerns, and I mean, not just the you know, building of the facility, but uh, costs that flow from uh, the reluctance of the American people to support nuclear uh, power uh, that, that, that flows into the insurance costs and the enormous damage that can come from uh, a, a breakdown in the process um, as opposed 
exposed to other forms of energy. Um, so that it's uh, not gonna happen. Um, and you know, Maine has gotten along just fine without any nuclear facilities. We're doing fine on, uh, and we're building up our uh, renewables and, and other sources of energy. Of course, it's a small state, small population, brief geography, but. Um, uh, so that's my question to you. What about the cost? Do you want to start? Yeah, so yeah. If, if I may. Um, and I've been to Maine, Yankee, and I will tell you that uh, Maine is a uh, beautiful state. And you're right, you are doing fine. But again, uh, take a look at CO2 emissions worldwide. That is not doing fine. So the, with respect to the cost, yes, nuclear power plants are large, complex machines that have to be built for safety. They cost a lot, billions upon billions of dollars. That's why you do not see a renaissance of new build across the United States. The future, however, and that's where, so what's next for nuclear power? Because even if, you know, all the plants that are operating today run through their current lifetime, by 2050, essentially you're going to be down to a handful of nuclear power plants. So what's the, uh, the, the next course of action? And how do you bring those uh, costs down? The technology that's being developed today is it's what's called accident-tolerant fuel. So if you can design and build fuel that essentially will not melt, that's a game changer. So with new ceramic materials today and fuel that can withstand 5,000 degrees C and cannot melt, well, then you can build them at a cheaper uh, uh, price point. So, but the market today, if, uh, if I'm a privately owned or if I'm a utility and I have a choice between investing $800 million for a 1,000 uh, megawatt gas plant or $12 billion for a nuclear power plant, right, economics are going to drive that. That is a great question. I'm really glad you asked it. And I'm going to answer it in three ways. One of them is, does, does the operation of existing nuclear plants right now help Maine? And I would say yes. The millstone units provide 40% of the electricity in New England. Maine is part of the six-state integrated grid. Given the transmission investment, it really is a pool of electricity provided by all of the power plants. The study that we have done of the impacts of shut down, shutting down the two millstone units would raise prices for Maine consumers. So forget the, uh, forget the greenhouse gas emissions issues, assume safe operations, but tomorrow the prices will go up. That happened when Vermont Yankee went down. It didn't happen when Maine Yankee went down because the, the market was not operating in the same way. So the consumers of Maine were paying for Maine Yankee at the time through regulated rates, and it's changed. And so right now, Maine has a stake in whether Millstone shuts down or not, or Seabrook shuts down or not, just the way that these implications also occur in the same kind of way in the other states like New York, where they, they came to the same conclusion, frankly, and then PJM, I know there was a study by Brattle Group of the implications of shutdown of the nuclear units on prices. So I am not suggesting that a state act to avoid that price impact because that might have cost, that might have implications for interstate commerce uh, defenses in court for your reason for keeping a nuclear plant open, but there are those impacts. So that's number one. Number two, it does cost a lot for the owners of those existing non-utility power plants. The same is true for a utility power plant, but an, a non-utility owner of an existing plant. They do have to put a lot of money in each and every year, which is what is affecting their, it, it, what's contributing to affect their decision about whether to retire them. In light of those heavy costs to keep a plant operating, and the low natural gas price effects on electricity revenues, that's, that's a bad combination. And it's not sustainable for most of the owners. So that's why they are looking for making sure that the prices in those markets are reflecting the value. Now the third thing is, you are absolutely right, or in my opinion, about a building of a new type of plant using today's technology. That is not going to happen. 
um, the a balance. So if it's an eight or nine billion dollar investment, and you've got a company whose balance sheet is maybe two or three times that, they're not going to make that bet. It's really expensive. So the only way it's going to work for the United States to keep a nuclear candle alive, in my opinion, with new technology, is these advanced reactors. And that's a catchphrase that people use for small, modular, different type of fuel, different type of cooling requirements. They are proliferation resistant. They are just very different animals. And so you don't have to bet the financial farm on them. I think there are probably large steel mills in the world who would actually contract for such a unit if it were to be developed in a more manufactured, uh, uniform way that keeps the cost down. So your, your question is totally right, um, that cost really does matter in all of this. I'm going to have to, uh, I'm getting the cut sign from Rona, uh, because we have a, a, full, a fully packed, jam-packed day. But I really want to thank all the panelists. And I know they're going to be around for a while, so people can interact with them and uh, pursue lines of questioning. And thank you, everybody. And Rona, you're coming back up, correct? Thank you so much, Representative Reed and our panelists for that really terrific discussion. I think Jake said that we could talk about this issue for hours. Unfortunately, we don't have hours, but hopefully we can um, pick it up at another time. We are scheduled to have a brief 15-minute break, but before we do so, I'd like to invite Professor Elke Weber, I hope I'm pronouncing your name properly, to, to come up and talk about a project that she's working on and for which she would like your input. Thank you so much, Rona. Uh, I'm Elke Weber. I'm a professor here at Princeton in the Anlinger Center in the Woodrow Wilson School and also in psychology. And I head up a research project that looked at the arguments that citizens, uh, policymakers, and legislators consider when they make decisions about actions on climate change. Now, we very rarely have an audience like yourselves you know, who are as informed and as authoritative on these issues. And so we'll be here all day. And when I say we, I also mean Sylvia Piatti, who is a policy scholar from Bocconi in Italy and Adrian Winscheid, who is a political scientist from St. Gallen in Switzerland, and we'll be listening to you. But more importantly, I also want to ask you, beg you really, to fill out a short survey for us. Uh, it takes two to three minutes, has been approved by the Institutional Review Board here at Princeton, and it's completely anonymous. Uh, and uh, we will feed back the responses that you give to us uh, collectively through RONA, so you get to find out what, what you and your colleagues are saying about this. Uh, we will be outside with copies of the survey in the coffee break and later on today as well. You can return it into a box. It's on the uh, desk, at the registration desk. Uh, if you have questions uh, to us, please talk to us at any point during the conference, ideally after you do the survey. And again, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>